Hello everyone, uh, I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Um, so today I gathered this lovely and quite big group of UA masters uh, to discuss a very pressing issue, uh, how to navigate through the very clustered and cluttered uh, UA ecosystem and make true data-driven decisions uh, to optimize campaigns, scale UA and win over the competition. So uh, my name is Irina, by the way. I've been in the ad tech industry for almost 10 years now. Um, and now I'm very excited to be with Bitshake, which is a multi-channel data aggregation and campaign management platform that helps to automate UA. Um, so let's begin. So guys, can you please introduce yourselves and tell us what was the last UA task that you completed before coming here? Hey guys, I'm Farhan. Uh, I'm the head of performance marketing and mobile growth uh, cyber games. Um, and my background, is, I've been there for just under a year. I've previously worked at Social Point in Barcelona and uh, Nanobit in Croatia. Um, and my last UA task was, um, I guess, soft launching uh, one of our titles and driving UA to look at day one retention. Hey guys, uh, my name is Matija Lancevic and I've been in the industry for like seven years so far. I'm uh, currently heading the UA team at uh, Superscale and pre previously I was at Pixel Federation which is a Slovak developer company. And my last task in UA was delegating the reporting to the UA managers. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, I'm the black sheep out here. Um, I'm Yeshis uh, and I'm, I'm a partnerships manager at uh, Apps Flyer and it's been three years since I did uh, a, a UA task, so I'm so happy I'm not doing that out here. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Stefan, I work at um, SuperSolid, I'm user acquisition manager there, also in charge of ASO, um, and my, I've been working there for three years, starting my career in UA here, um, and the last task I uh, was doing before coming here was rethinking our creative strategy for our uh, latest title. Okay, so I'm Michael uh, from the Netherlands. I'm working at Social Point for roughly a year now. I'm managing two games there before I was in a scooter sharing application in Barcelona as well. Um, I've been in the app industry for six years roughly, and the last thing I did in terms of uh, UA was setting some automated reports uh, for my colleagues. I have my own. Hi, my name is Aline. A year ago I joined uh, Ubisoft as a user acquisition expert. In the industry, I think I'm more than eight years and it was a long way between Russia, Israel and now London. Uh, and the last task, I think, was just checking the reports before the conferences. <laughs> of course. Uh, so now that we got to know you a little bit, can you maybe tell us what was the channel that you scaled the most in 2019? Eileen, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, for us, I think the, the most surprising one yeah, yeah. was uh, Snapchat. Um, I'm managing it myself and our team, and um, we have a very we had a very interesting case. Uh, we have one portfolio of games that is narrative games for women, and we usually saw it's about 25, 30 plus audience, but eventually we found out that Snapchat audience in US, that wasn't for us a uh, biggest market, is converting very good 21 plus. So for us, was it was a big scale, actually. Great. Anyone else? Um, on our side, it would be cross insel I would say, uh, especially on the programmatic side. Uh, they have a lot of good volume uh, across all of the games, so we were managing to be able to, to scale them to our second, third biggest, biggest partner across all the, all the company. So I would say that. Yeah, um, for, for us, uh, Snapchat as well, actually, uh, outperformed Google UAC for some games. The last channel I uh, scaled was Snapchat. We're not doing UA at scale currently with Cyber, but with Nanobit, that's what we scaled first. So again, shout out to Snap. Um, 
<laughs> uh, actually, Appsla sits in such a unique position that we can actually look into everybody else, what they're doing, and, and uh, agree to all of them. I think Snap has been uh, one of the biggest gainers uh, when we compare to 2018 data to 19. But apart from that, the big four consolidation, when you say like self-reporting networks, there's also an emergence between other DSP networks, especially on the video side and playable side, uh, which has come up with uh, lower CPIs and higher growth rates. So I think that's one of the uh, biggest surprises, if we can look. So it's not just um, the big four, like Snap, Google, and Facebook, and uh, uh, Twitter. It's also the other emergence of networks as well. So wait, who are the runner-ups then? Like, do you remember? Um, it's, I, I would say like there is, if you look at iOS, I think Apple Search has, has made some big gains, um, and the cross installer is one of them. When you look at both Android and iOS, uh, it depends upon their regions. Um, we have some surprise players. Uh, the S couple of emulators have come up good. Um, in the TapJoy and uh, Apple Oven, they have always been good there, but also like Maloko at the, the like a surprise that I've come up a couple of times. Cool. Um, so can, can I have one question? Um, because we are uh, almost starting running the TikTok. Uh, yeah. Do you have any experiences that you can share, maybe? Yeah, I mean, uh, TikTok's an uh, amazing platform, to be honest, and uh, we have made some, uh, th like, this tremendous growth that we are seeing, I think. If you're talking about 2019, if, I think 2000, probably by next month or so, we might have, like, much more concrete data about the strikes that TikTok has taken. So if you're, the same question, if you ask me next month or uh, by end of the Q1, I would say TikTok will be number one, uh, one of the surprise packages, uh, especially with uh, the CPM, rates and as well as uh, the you know the quality that they're coming it's not just the quantity but also the quality has been really good okay so I'm hearing a lot of different networks especially from uh, from you um, so guys maybe uh, you can tell us a bit what's on your UA stack and I'm talking about attribution advertising channels BI tools what do you do for reporting everything um, so yeah, for us, like uh, for attribution, we, we use Adjust. Um, in terms of sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in terms of, so for us, we've recently launched a new game. Um, so we have started with like the classic Facebook and Google. Um, also starting using Snapchat and learning from it. Um, in terms of data and insights, we use Google BigQuery and we pair it with a um, looker for data visualization um, to help us have like the bigger picture in terms of um, correlation and reporting, uh, using the job for everyone. Um, and also, I would include in the AI so in the new AS task, we include ASO. We use a tool called uh, AppTweak um, because, like, we believe that you can get an uplift uh, from your UA if you get the ASO right. Because the more you increase your conversion from ASO, um, the more likely you get you will increase uh, the conversion from UA. And the other around, you can get an uplift in your um, ASO. Uh, I know some people are able to get like for two people they get from UA, they can get three people for free from ASO, so uh, it can be a great K factor also for you in terms of, of growth. So this is uh, basically how we consider UA. Eileen? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just saw my colleagues, so I stuck. Um, so yeah, we are using AmpSlayer for tracking. Uh, we are also using Singular for all the costs collection. And we are very lucky we have a good uh, internal analytics that are just Ubisoft One uh, with a very nice prediction system and also alert system. So I think all our um, UI managers get in the morning report where is it's highlighted like green and red, what is good or bad. So in this case, they don't need to search for all the data, but just, you know, the emerge one to quickly change something in these campaigns. Um, yeah, for Facebook, we are for Facebook campaigns and Google as well. I think we are using Bidalgo. Um, that's it. Cool. Matei. Yeah, so uh, basically, Superscale started as like a data analysis and business intelligence company. So we're trying to rely on uh, like internal uh, big data team. We are working very closely with them, so we are gathering like all the data from all data sources for from like AppSlayer, UA channels, and 
the um, stores as well, and then uh, plugging in into the, our own like reporting system, ROAS sheets, LTV predictions, and we also built one uh, targeting uh, in-house option that is um, actually available on um, Smartly or Atquant by Kenshu, and we're using it on our own. So basically trying to do everything in-house. Michael, you have something to add? So at Social Point, we're using Apps Flyer as well for attribution. Um, we are using uh, our BI is the same as what you guys have, um, which is Looker, which works in the same way as uh, you were saying. It tells you basically uh, in terms of colors what's above your target, what not. So you, it's easy to uh, adjust bits if needed. Uh, it tells you to increase or where to decrease budget. So it's quite automated already. And we're in the process of having this all automated as well. So we can basically, if if a certain value is uh, 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 higher or lower than a certain uh, threshold that we put ourselves, uh, they can automate it automatically um, increase or decrease the bits. Okay, so I've been hearing a little bit about automation here from your answers. So can you maybe uh, talk a bit more about that? Like what exactly do you automate? How does it help you to improve campaigns? And what are still like the struggles with it? Mm, so as I said, the most automated part of uh, our tools is uh, BI. Actually, everything is works without us. And um, then we just did a naming convention automation tool as well, because to collect everything inside Tableau, we really need naming convention to be very restricted. And also now we're working on uh, bid optimization, but it's in process. I hope we will have it in 2020. Great. Michael? So yeah, what I was just saying, like we're using Looker for that, so the bit optimization we're doing now right there, so now we already have a, like a prediction, uh, like what's the max viable CPI that we can pay for certain campaigns, certain countries, certain sub-publisher even, it goes quite deep. And in terms of creatives, we're doing something similar, so we have like a naming convention now, uh, every uh, creative that we're currently putting out has certain elements inside the name. Uh, so for example, if it's a two, uh, 2D animation or 3D animation, if it's gameplay, if it's fake gameplay, uh, if it's action related or whatever. And we add these tags inside every creative that we're putting out in all the networks. And we can then in Looker say, okay, what is the kind of creative that works about what elements do they have? Um, which ones have the highest IPM, which one have the highest click-through rate, etc. And therefore we can can optimize our creative strategy. And what else is automated? Well, uh, we're testing now the, the Facebook uh, UAC automatic app ads. So this is also pretty uh, black box again, like Google. So uh, yeah, that's, that's it. There's something I want to say about this. Auto I think automation is very important, um, especially like on video ad networks. These days, you spend a lot of time uh, blacklisting, whitelisting your subsources and changing your CPI bids. And the, your UA team can be bogged down doing this on a daily basis. So I think it's important to use the right kind of tools to do that, but at the same time, to make sure that those tools are still optimizing in the most efficient way. So it doesn't replace your UA team. They still need like um, validation, but uh, having the right balance of using your, the, your UA managers and optimized tools is, is a key uh, ingredient to getting your UA right? Well, yeah, I obviously agree with you. <laughs> um, I, I, in terms of uh, automation, I think there's one more thing that we are seeing is more and more companies, or, you know, especially on the gaming side, I think they're trying to look what data is. They're, they're not... Uh, you know, looking at raw data, looking at other types of data, I think that's that's one aspect about what they can do with that data. Um, I, I think we already spoke about UA, but there's one more channel which most uh, the people are taking across using the data is also on the retargeting side of things. Um, and there are more tech stack elements that's being built across. So if, of course, attribution comes in the first place, you know, not just because I'm from attribution, but basically <laughs> you course, want, want to measure it. Uh, but then 
that we have also seen that the most of guys have a BI tools, like you're saying, but then they're building about campaign optimization tools because, of course, you're not just working with one of them. You're working with major different part of it and how you can send the data back to them. And then the new element which has come across is uh, engagement partners. I don't know if anybody of you are working on it, but you know it's about how to customize it, how to uh, ensure there's like a welcoming uh, you know picture to the uh, users who have come in, so you can target them much more specific. Have Have any of you worked with an engagement partner or come across? Okay, it's just probably me with somebody else. <laughs> Do you mean re-engagement? Um, yeah, re-engagement is one aspect. Of course, they use that as a re-engagement tool, but it's also uh, like you know push partners, uh, be like you know praise and airships and everybody else. They're using them, and there's also uh, for it's basically for if you have some set of users, you want to retain them, and how can you retain them by like getting them to come back to the app again? Because that also helps you to improve your LTV. Uh, that's one of the other major aspect why they're building this upon what other tech stacks that they have. Okay, besides the, the classic uh, reporting that uh, it's automated, we also build like data val validator because every time we started like working with uh, with the company, we need to check all the data if that if matches all the sources like attribution stores, Facebook and stuff. So we build an automated tool to validate that. Cool. And how does this automation affect like internal processes, the team structure, uh, time management? inside the team. You can fire half your team, right? No, uh, I hope not. No, I think it optimizes the, um, the team well. So like, the, going back to my point about the efficient optimization, if you have your UA managers uh, bogged down doing that on a daily, weekly, weekly basis, they can't really be focused too much on the rest of the stuff that makes the marketing machine work. So that's both on the creative side, the, the ASO side, and also understanding the product and doing significant research in the market. I've worked with quite a few UA teams, and a lot of the guys I work with may not know the, the, the rest of the marketplace well. And I think it's one of the jobs of the UA team to um, as the sellers of the game to be able to go to the product and say, hey, this is what you should be doing to make the game more appealable. So I think it's important to for the UA guys to have the right kind of balance of um, um, optimizing versus you know um, other hands-on work with product. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with Farin as well. Like uh, we have we have one of our data scientists working on um, creating a proxy event, which is a combination of like several events that people and players are performing within the twenty first their first twenty four hours of playing the game. And with that, he is able to tell like uh, a clustering the user automatically. Uh, they will be high LTV users and low LTV users. Um, and then with that, either creating a, a custom audience, uh, extracting it directly, or uh, better having the uh, proxy uh, in adjust directly and having it updating uh, dynamically so when then you optimize toward that event uh, on Facebook for example um, the, um, the targeting is still on point and the thing is that then I can extract list of events and Again, yeah, we can tell the product team which kind of behavior people are um, people are performing and how to optimize the game towards that. Eileen? Yeah, like uh, eight years ago when I started to work, almost I think 90% of my time was in Excel trying to optimize the things. Now uh, everybody in our team I think have time to do much more with all, all this aut automation, to do more testing, to think more about creative strategy, to search for new regions, to stop, uh, start UA. Um, and that's what like in general automation give all of us we, we, we much we less working on statistics and more about like common strategies uh, in term, when I, I think this, I, I feel like going back, rolling back to years. Uh, when I was doing UA, uh, automation for me was like I automate so much that I fire myself, uh, <laughs> uh, because you want to ensure that you know the, the, all the data and everything is in the right place. I mean, we have a cohort API. I think that was a good thing that you brought across. Is like, I think getting getting the right cohorts is like a big thing for most of the UA managers right now. They want to get that r right. Uh, 
uh, set of cohorts, right set of audiences, so they can target them correctly. I think we send uh, Code API to BitShake right now, so people use that to get back to the users or try to create like and you know similar audiences or have like a better exclusion list. Um, I think that's also one of the automation sense which is uh, most of the UA managers are using that we are seeing from the outset. Okay, so where are you guys seeing this trend uh, heading in 2020? And what will be like the, what, what are your personal goals to, I mean, not only in terms of automation or the day-to-day -day management, but also on the bigger picture, on the creative side of your work, on the strategy side? I can start, yeah. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned before, if bef uh, like uh, eight years ago, most like I was working in Russia, and UA manager was considered is very uh, mathematical person who working with numbers only, and doesn't care about anything else. So now I feel my job more about creativity. I think now creatives taking. Uh, more important part because users already saw and what I'm seeing actually in Facebook or whatever other p platform is the same creatives about different games and it's becoming more and more boring and less and less working so uh, especially we are inside Ubisoft trying to work on this more analyzing get some inspiring ideas and um, yeah I think this is one of the trends that is going it's not about optimization but it's about the changing of the workflow um, yeah. Meanwhile, it's only one idea I have. So, guys, <laughs> talking. Okay. That's a good idea. Uh, yeah. yeah. As Eileen says, like uh, UA guys, they're not just data guys. They may have been in the past, but they're marketing people, right? So, they have to have a good focus on what what makes the product sell. So I think now with optimization tools, we can focus more on creative iteration. And more and more, the UA teams I've worked with have uh, learned how to produce more creative and test with a more scientific approach to creative, rather than just have one creative that runs for six months to a year. Uh, even when I was back at Social Point, before Michael was there, we, we still had creative for Monster Legends of Dragon City that was top performing, that was two years old. So obviously that doesn't work so well anymore. And uh, yeah, like, more focus on the right kind of things can be done with uh, auto with automation in place. Yeah, and I think to to add on to this, um, like what I was saying before, by what we're doing with adding these tags in the creatives, um, you can actually see what works. You can break a creative down, and this was something that was not possible before. You know, you always test A/B testing, uh, like a new creative versus a control group. Um, but it was true what what Farhan's saying. Like some creatives are the best performing ones are two, three years old, and why? You don't know. You don't don't know what kind of elements because every creative has a, a bit at least. Uh, in our case, have a little bit of gameplay, uh, a little bit of characters, a little bit of uh, 2D or 3D, but what specific thing triggers that high CTR or high RPM? So this is something that, what, by breaking that down, uh, you can go a lot deeper into into the creative itself. And I think also with playables, I mean, I guess all of us have experience, uh, experience with that. So with playables as well, like you can create so many, like you can break it down as well and change uh, stuff inside the playable you can even measure it exactly like where people drop out where they click when they click so all this this whole cycle um, breaks creatives down and I think that's where we're going to where we can really optimize creatives in a much deeper way than we could have only done two years ago um, and I think also like with automation this is I mean it's obvious but automating automation for automation itself it is, it's not worth it it's like you get to, need to get to the ground of like what are you running UA and like what makes a, a game worse scale with UA and it's profitable growth so um, you need always to ask yourself uh, what I'm paying for if it's a service or what I'm spending time to implement is gonna be worth the time um, because like as mentioned like for, for creatives there's still creativity is, is hard to automate creativity right so and yeah maybe it's the next big challenge because yeah everything regarding uh, hard data is able to uh, you're able to automate almost of it um, from the reporting to algorithm um, but it come when it comes to um, creative it's like how you use the data to nurture your creativity and to make it scale even better. 
Yeah, so back to the, the, the creatives, uh, we've spent a lot of time like with the creative analysis and um, you're trying to build like a tool when you can export from one creative like seven versions just in one click and like not the totally different uh, creative but different headlines, different color palettes, different um, buttons for example. So we use time effective from our like uh, creative designers. <laughs> Sorry, I have like a side question. It's lovely to be like, no, not doing UA. But how much do you think like a bid optimization to a creative optimization is important, uh, especially when there are like new avenues coming, like TikToks and everything? I think. Do you think it's important to look at these new channels plus the creative that has worked in other channels, or do you feel like there's a constant need to spit out new creatives? I, th I think creative per channel is actually quite different. Um, back in the day, we'd use the same creative, but obviously on social media compared to a video network, uh, incentivize versus non incentivizes is a big difference. But even we found with Facebook and Snapchat, the creative can be very different because the audience is largely different and the experience is going to be different. And that's what we'll see with TikTok. The kind of the stuff you get on TikTok is very different to the content you get on Facebook and Snapchat. So things that will work on TikTok, I expect, will be very different um, creative. So the creative iteration has to be per channel if you're going to scale UA correctly. So that's kind of my belief. Yeah, I'm probably too old. I, I don't get TikTok, the content there. I just, I don't know why why people are doing it. But uh, obviously, like, uh, for the, the creative analysis, uh, that's why we are pulling, like, the all the data from all channels uh, on the creative level so we know, like, what's working and where. <laughs> Uh, in Ubisoft, I think most of our games are very narrow, like small audiences targeting. So for us, it's uh, always a bit challenge because it should be the right creatives on the right beat on the right audience. So uh, creatives even could be different on different audiences. And also, like we don't have, I think, s too strict things about CPI or beats, but like more about um, ROI. And also I have a question to other uh, guys. Uh, if you are looking on creatives in terms of ROI or on the IPM and like CTR? Yeah, it's a combination, right? So uh, definitely IPM and how the, the creative resonates, but also like the ultimate goal is ROI on the creative level. I, I think from data standpoint, from attribution, I think uh, w what we are seeing from more and more UA matches is on the impression level. Uh, they're looking at more IPM. I think that would be the, uh, the, for some reason, two years ago or something, there was more focus on like CPIs and CPAs, but now it's they've rolled it back to like, again, I think optimizing on impression level makes much more sense than probably on a CPA level. I just, just want to point out, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, the UA managers have finally moved on from the fact that looking at their CPIs, uh, like back in the day we used to be like, oh, so we pay $3 and that's it, it's, a, it's not the right way to go, you need to be able to understand the, the rest of the, the metrics well, and that's why people are looking more in, in the conversions and, um, and the ROI itself, it's, the, the ROI ranges so hugely between network to network, like you could pay $5 plus on Facebook and then on other networks pay 20 cents, so uh, yeah. it, it makes a huge difference. And that's why the creative and the, the conversion rates massively vary between channel. And you have to just keep an eye on all of that stuff. Okay, I've been signaled that they're about to kick us off the stage, so I want to open uh, to questions from the audience, if someone has. And we'll do it really, really quickly, I swear. <laughs> it took you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Mike and I'm working on the hyper casual games. Um, so in terms of uh, UA managers working on the common strategies, what sort of tools do you use for research and crafting these common strategies when it comes to UA? Um, in terms of tools just for creatives, for example, uh, now you can use like the very useful Facebook ID library. Um, it's like really uh, touching the surface, but you can like uh, get an idea of like what people are doing, what are your competition doing. Um, 
and see like yeah, the trends uh, that you see. Like for example, if you look at the um, Playrix guide for homescapes, you see that their ads are quite different to the look and feel of the actual game. Um, and also like if you have this discussion like with App Annie, uh, you have their tool like to check like uh, also at the ad network level. Uh, so that's one hint. Yeah, I would say the same. App Annie, that was what I was, uh, the one that I was going to mention. Yeah, it's, it's basically the same as a library on Facebook, but it just, it's on a network level, so you can see all the creators, what kind of networks they, uh, certain partners are using for certain OSs. So it can give you a glimpse, like, okay, if you want to open markets, or you want to, you want to soft launch something, uh, you can see, okay, a similar game is, has a lot of traffic from X partner in this kind of country, so it can help you with uh, defining your strategy. Uh, in the market you want to go to. Except of the tools that guys I mentioned, I'm using Russian KGB network. <laughs> <laughs> Russians everywhere and they know everything, so yes. <laughs> she really does. <laughs> At this conference, by the way. <laughs> I share one more. Besides, I'm kind of Sorry. Do you use anything besides that? Yeah, other than App Annie, Sensor Tower, I recommend just play, I, I tend to just play all the games in the market, especially the top charts. They're constantly ev evolving. The top 50 charts in the UK, US, uh, on the game side are f like 90, 95% hyper casual. And if you want to understand more about ads, just uh, you get so many of them uh, in each one of those apps. So I kind of tend to play tend to play a lot of different games to see how the ads have been integrated and what kind of ads are showing up there. So obviously it's not, uh, you have to play a lot of it to work out the market, but at least you see uh, a lot of the popular ads that way. Okay, one last question. Anyone? No? Okay. So thank you very, very much. And thank you guys for joining me here on stage. It was a very great discussion.